Nicole, welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to have you here. Hello, Denise. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so let's start off with an introduction. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yes, I'm Nicole Nieves. I run a marketing and brand agency called The Brand Vibe. We help entrepreneurs just like yourself to start, grow, and scale your business, really looking at how to monetize and market your brand as a whole, primarily for online entrepreneurs who are just ready to diversify their income and really step into their passion and make money on their own. I'm here for all of it. And so you have been a part of my power squad, I will call it this year, where you've helped me just really refine the way that we show up online in our email marketing, just really becoming super cohesive and clear on the messages that we're putting out there. And so first off, let's distinguish a brand. Like what makes a brand a brand? I love this because so many people aim to start a business, but don't really think about the brand behind it. Or when they think about a brand, they think about colors and logos, maybe a website, what that looks like online. But really, my favorite way to describe a brand is what Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon, says. And that is that your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. It truly is the personality behind your business. It's who you are. It's what they vibe with. It's your story. It really is that connection point. So without that piece, if you're just out to build a business, you're going to miss that opportunity to really connect with your audience and set yourself apart. But it's so much more than just having cohesive colors. That's helpful, but that's not the end all be all of branding. I'm glad you mentioned that because I think that's where a lot of folks end their thought process. It's like, let me get the logo. Let me get the colors. Let me get the templates that have all the cute fonts and whatever. And it's like, No, it's so much more than that, right? So let's dive into brand voice. What is a brand voice? Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing behind it is essentially if you really had to give your brand a personality, how would that come across? Are you witty? Are you bold? Are you welcoming? Are you inclusive? Like, what do you want that to feel like? And for a lot of startup entrepreneurs who are truly building essentially personal brands, a lot of that is going to be who you are and how you show up. So really think about your personality. And this is why I love so much focusing on branding, because you really get to connect with your audience based off of being authentically you. And I know that that phrase is kind of thrown out a lot, like just be authentic, just be you. But truly, if you try to be someone that you're not, if you try to create a brand that is more bold and more forward facing, but you're more calm and welcoming and more of a connector, then you're going to have a huge disconnect on either the type of people you bring in or you're not going to be bringing in the type of people that you're excited about serving at the end of the day. So really understanding your brand voice comes down to if someone was just coming across your blog online, listening to a podcast, coming across a social media post, what do you want them to know about you? What do you want them to feel when they're reading that post? That's how you want your voice to sound. That's how you want your content to be created, essentially. That was a really helpful exercise for me putting together a brand voice kit because then when we think about outsourcing content, outsourcing emails, outsourcing anything that's supposed to represent the brand, it's very clear to whoever it is that you're working with what the vibe should be. It's not like they're going to start sending emails or doing social media captions that sound nothing like you. And it's just like, who the hell is this and what happened to the original version? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And when we start working with clients, that's the first thing that we ask for. And if they don't have it, then we create one together. But if you're looking to either start your business and start creating your own content or essentially bring on a VA, bring on a team, outsource to an agency, you want to have that because a lot of the disconnect if you're hiring an agency is it doesn't sound like me, it doesn't feel like me, or you're constantly editing when at the end of the day, you want to be able to kind of give them a guide so they can bring that to life even more. And you can hire an expert to help pull that out of you. Because sometimes we're just so close to it. We're like, oh, I don't really know. How do I want to sound? What does that look like? And so we work with clients to really kind of identify what does make the most sense, what does sound like you, and really creating content that amplifies that. I love that. And I have found that for especially entrepreneurs of color, this idea of like connecting with your voice can be a really sobering exercise in unlearning all of the code switching and the corporate bullshit that a lot of us feel like how we have to show up in a professional sense. I know for me, it was hard to start to think about like, who am I? What does my voice actually sound like? Because I feel like I couldn't be myself in corporate America. 
Yes. Oh my gosh. So coming from a corporate background myself, 15 years of working in corporate, living there, you are truly trained and conditioned to communicate a certain way because that's what's going to allow you to get to the top faster. That's when it, what's going to allow people to respect you more. And I think especially as a woman of color, it's like even more so wanting to go above and beyond with that professionalism and expertise. And so when you come to the entrepreneur playground, essentially, you're like, okay, I get to basically decondition all of that and really find myself again, find who I am, find how I do want to communicate, not how I think others need to perceive me or what I think needs to be said so that people can relate to me, but truly who I am. And those that are going to come are going to come. And those that aren't, like, I'm fine with that. (laughs) Exactly. Those are not my people. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) So I'd love to dive more into your own background, your experience doing this and what made you want to work for yourself? Because I think that's the dream for a lot of folks, right? So tell us about that journey. Yeah, it really is. My mom had me at a very young age. She was actually 15 when she was pregnant with me, had me at 16 years old and became a single mom raising me from home and from a very young age. And so her biggest thing was she didn't get to graduate college, didn't even finish high school, got her GED. And it was all about how do I create a better life for my daughter, right? And so it was get your education, go to college, get a degree, stay focused, get a secure job, stable income, all that jazz. And so like so many of other Latinas, I've kind of followed that track. First generation college graduate, was straight A student. Really that focus of achievement was what my goal was. And a lot of it was rooted in really wanting to make my parents proud, wanting to make my mom proud, wanting to build this better life where we didn't have to switch schools. If I were to have a family, I I went to six schools growing up, we would have some stability. And so that's what I did. But what they don't tell you is what the hell to do when you are done with college. So I'm like, done, did it, graduated with honors in three years. Like I was acing it. And then what do I do now? So I essentially just took on a full-time job in the financial industry because it was what was available, what I was familiar with. I worked my way through college, paid my way through college. So it was kind of that next progressive step. And I fell into what I call kind of an accidental career that I think so many of us really fall into, not knowing what other paths there are. Meanwhile, while all this is happening, my dad was still very present in my life. And he actually had business after business growing up, had had that entrepreneurial spirit, but they were never sustainable. So he'd work really hard and it wouldn't actually work out. And so he'd start another business and he tried again. And so I kind of had both sides of seeing this entrepreneurial spirit in him. But at the end of the day, my mom was working three jobs. Like we were the ones trying to figure out how to create that stability. And so while I feel like I had a lot of that passion to want to do something on my own, I was so fearful of not being able to have that stability that I didn't dare pursue what I knew I was called to do. I didn't dare pursue something that was a little bit untraditional and outside of the norm. And so I just continued to climb the corporate ranks and attempt to work my way to the top, attempt to get a seat at the table. Yeah, I think so many folks that listen to this podcast can absolutely resonate with this idea of wanting to make all of our parents' sacrifices and struggles worth it. And so that's something that keeps us stuck, that can keep us in careers that we know are not aligned with what our true desires are. So what did you study in school? So I went to school for business administration, minor in marketing. So I knew that this was an area that I was really passionate about. One of my favorite classes in college was an entrepreneurship cohort. And I knew that that was rooted in me, but just wasn't exactly sure what to make of it at the end of it. So I had a pretty thriving career. I mean, I was vice president of sales at a pretty young age. I went on to be creative director, director of marketing, but I was just missing that passion piece. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up actually transitioning from corporate to a, a smaller nonprofit profit to really do something that was more aligned to serving just the smaller person, the local community. And that was going so well until it wasn't. Mm-hmm. It was year before COVID. So it was 2019. And we were let go. There were 40 of us that were let go. The company shut down, issues at the top. And I was just left here thinking like, I did everything right. Like I did the traditional path. I I pursued it. I was able to stay focused. And yet still, it was so out of my control. And that was a moment where I realized like, is this really security? Like, is this nine to five job truly that stability and security when it any moment that could be ripped from you. And you're left thinking like, what in the world do I do with my life right now? And that was a position that I was in. And then of course, fast forward to COVID, so many other people were in that position too. And it really just became a time of like, this is it. I'm either going to go out on my own. I'm going to try my own business. I'm going to make it happen. 
or I'm going to go back to the traditional ways. But this is a part of my story where I wish I could say I went all in and it was amazing and I never looked back. But actually, I did both for a season because all I knew was the corporate world. So I'm like, I'm going to dip my toe in this water of entrepreneurship while still looking for a job, while still applying for something. And so it was like at the point of me feeling confident in establishing my current company, The Brand Vibe, I literally at that point when I was like, all right, I'm ready to go all in, I end up becoming in the final stages of another position and get an offer as a creative director for a marketing agency. So I'm like, oh crap, here I am having <laughs> ready to start the thing that I'm so passionate about and this like secure job, what do I do? And so it's not necessarily the most traditional story, but I think so many people hear that and they're like, you go all in on your business. But frankly, I just think that entrepreneurship is its own journey and its own path. And for me, I had been out of a job for so long. I was trying to figure out what to do. And I knew that if I didn't have at least a net of security, I was going to go out after my business in a different way. It would have been more money hungry as opposed to passion driven. So I ended up taking the job, but disclosing up front, like I'm looking to start my own business. I'm serving a completely different audience, but I'm not going to give that up. And I just want to make sure that that's clear from the beginning. And fast forward a year later, I was able to quit that job and go all in on my business to where I am today. So it did end up working out, but it didn't necessarily look as traditional as what it might I freaking love that story. That is so inspiring and so real, right? Like I think, especially when we know that we don't have a safety net to rely on, you can't be out here reckless, just quit your fucking job with no plan. <laughs> like it's just not the move, right? And exactly. so this like shaming of people for taking the time and like really yeah. putting things in place and proving out your idea and making sure your business is sustainable, that's responsible entrepreneurship. And we need to clap for that type of stuff. Because yes. it's not the sexy journey, but it's the yep. shit that makes sense for a lot of us. Exactly. Amen to that. I mean, I think at the end of the day, like there are two philosophies, right? It's like, get over your fear, go all in. And if you do that, then you're investing everything into yourself. But there are so many mindset issues that we have to deal with as entrepreneurs, as humans in general, but as entrepreneurs too, like you don't need to add on to that with this pressure of having to do things traditional way or having to like go all in. You've got to do it in a way that makes sense for you and for your life. And I'm a mom of three kids. I had a house. I have three kids to feed. You know, I didn't want that pressure for my family, but I also knew that I didn't have to give up my passion in order for me to feed my family. Like I was able to do both. And it was exactly that until I proved up my concept, created an offer, worked with clients one-on-one, -on -one, was able to feel like this was something that was sustainable. I had an income goal month over month. And when I got to a point of like six months of consistency that I felt good to quit my job, that's when I did it. And I've never looked back from there. But I think if I pre- rushed it and I started sooner, I don't really know where I'd be right now. Yeah. We followed very similar trajectories. I wanted to prove out my proof of concept for six months. And so I was like, okay, I think this yeah. is real at this point. It's not a fluke. But you know, I think it's also important to realize that a lot of this like YOLO, go start your business advice comes from people who have hella privileges. So take it with a freaking grain of salt. Yep. It's so true. You know, and I think I took a lot from my youth and wanting to provide mostly it was like stability for my kids, for my family. Like that was not something that I was looking to risk. But at the same time, I think that that was almost the facade that I put on to hold me back from pursuing my passions as well. And it was kind of like the excuse I gave myself to not pursue it. And so being able to give myself permission to do both allowed me to be the achiever that I grew up as, that I still was as a mom and not lose sight of that while still feeling like I was able to provide for my family because we just couldn't afford to do otherwise. And when they finally met, those two roads met in the middle, then it was incredible. Everything changed from there. Yeah, I love that. Okay, so take us through those initial days of you launching your business and starting to get yourself out there, marketing yourself, starting to get those clients, right? Because that's the dream. The first person yep. that pays you, it's like, oh, shit, maybe this is yep. something. So tell us about that. 
You know, it's so funny because I just kicked off this podcast episode saying your brand is so much more than your website and your logos, but ask me what I worked on the first six months of my business. And it was my name, my website, my logos. You know what I mean? I think that that just comes with like really uncertainty on what I wanted to offer, uncertainty about whether I was really going to do this. It became like the safe thing to do. So for people who are just kind of starting with logos, starting with website and name, I would challenge you to really think about what is that deeper reason I knew about Better, but for me, it felt safe to start there because I didn't actually like have to risk anything quite yet. And so finally, I snapped myself out of it and was like, holy cow, I am literally falling into the trap that I know better. And what I need to do is just put it out there. And so I always recommend if you're just getting started in your business, this is if you're like baby, baby starter. And I had a bunch of corporate experience, but I'm transitioning there, transferring that into this online space to do what you can in working with clients one-on-one and in free free beta groups to get started with or discounted beta groups if you're more comfortable with that. And it really depends on your journey. If you have been doing this a while and you have a brand name and you have an audience and you have a community and now you're adding on an offer, it's a little bit different. But if you're just really trying to test out what you're passionate about and what you can do, I would really recommend to do some market research and to start working with clients one-to-one. And the biggest reason for that is because you get a chance to really hear from them and work with them through what's going to help set them apart What's the transformation you're looking for? What is your unique method to help them get there? Because at the end of the day, like anyone can help anyone start a blog. Anyone can help someone build a business. Anyone can help someone market on social media. But what way are you doing it and what transformation are they going after? And when you do that with enough clients, you will get more confident. And that's probably the biggest win from that. It's not the one or two clients that come in. It's not just the social proof. It's the confidence in yourself. It's you being able to show up differently after you've done that so that when you do start a course or you do a larger group program, you're able to do that with so much more confidence in who you are and what you can do than you ever were before. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense. I think a lot of folks fall into that trap of like working on the logo and shit because it feels like I'm doing something. I'm making progress, but it's a false sense of like actual action. It's fluff. (laughs) At the end of the day, it doesn't fucking matter. (laughs) No one's paying me because I have a beautiful logo. Like people are paying me because I have an offer that they're going to need that's going to get them a transformation. And so until you force yourself to work on the more important thing to create that service and that offer that people are going to want, you're just doing things that like give yourself a pat on the back, make you feel a little bit better, but it isn't actually going to move the needle in your business. Yes. Okay. So I think one of the biggest blocks that people have about marketing is this idea of like, everybody's already doing this. What's the point? How am I going to stand out? Is that an actual reason to not show up and market your business? You know, so funny. I actually just upgraded all of our phones to the Apple 14. I was in person at the T-Mobile store and I'm looking around and in my head, I'm like, why does any phone or any other brand even bother when Apple is clearly the most superior out of everything, you know? (laughs) But as I'm walking in there, there is brand after brand and phone after phone. And as I'm waiting for them to take care of my paperwork, I'm looking at these other phones and I'm like, oh, this is pretty good. Oh, okay. I really like this. You know, I start to like gravitate towards that. I'm looking at ads. I'm looking at other things. And here's the thing. Every brand in the world had the mentality of someone else is already doing it and slaying it with like an, a giant like Apple, then there would not be e-commerce. Like this just would not be a thing. And so we really have to get out of our heads and thinking someone else is doing it. If someone else is doing it. That means there's proof of concept. If someone else is doing it. That means there's an opportunity for you to do it your way and you to do it better. McDonald's leads the way across the world, but how many burger joints are out there? And how many of you guys are just not a fan of McDonald's? Like you will find your people who get to connect with who you are, what your story is, and what your offer and products are in such a unique way. So instead of looking at it as everyone else is doing it, it's oversaturated. I want you to look at it through a new lens of if other people want this, it's a proven concept. And I get to figure out how to show up in my own genius and add my own flair, my my own vibe, my own status to it to find my people and grow just the same, if not better than what someone else is doing. Yeah. It really is about giving yourself permission to show up in the space that you want to show up in. Yeah. You know, and like, just stop talking yourself out of shit before you even start. 
get out of your head. We all do it. We were all there. And you're going to go through it at different phases. It's not like you start a business and all of a sudden you're not thinking about it. You might have a new offer idea, a new thing you want to branch into. Maybe you did one-on-one and you want to start a new course or you did a course and you want to start an agency. And so we can go through these cycles and these ebbs and flows of entrepreneurship at all the different phases, but you've got to get out of your own way and allow yourself to just show up in the best way possible for your people. Absolutely. Okay, I think another beast that tends to overwhelm people is social media. I would argue, right, that like social media is a necessary evil for many of us, especially if you're a digital centric entrepreneur. But I mean, I would argue that anybody who has a business needs to be on social in some way. How do you, A, start showing up in a way that attracts the people that you want and B, not let it become your obsession? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The pivotal question of all. I mean, I think so many entrepreneurs are like, I did not sign up for this life. Like I signed up to live in my genius, do what I do best, like not show up and dance on reels, not have to create how-to tips. Like that is not the vibe. That's not what I'm a part of. And so that can either get in our heads where we're just like, we don't know what we're doing. So let's just follow so-and-so's advice and do it exactly the way that they're doing because it works. Or we don't do it at all. And so we're missing an opportunity. The biggest thing is to ask yourself, like, what do you enjoy? There are so many different ways to show up online. I'm a big believer in running your business your way, marketing your way. So when it comes to your social media, what do you enjoy? What don't you enjoy? What allows you to show up in your genius and shine best? What if... If you didn't have to do it, you would do it anyway. Like, let's just Marie Kondo your social media and give you permission to get rid of anything that does not bring you joy and to just focus on the things that do. I think that there's a lot that's shifting in social right now where people are kind of tired of seeing the same old, same old. And so they really are welcoming anyone who wants to embrace things in a unique way. And so for you, if that means that you're able to go online and dance and show up on reels because that's fun for you, that's fine. I love dancing too. So dancing reels, like I'll do those every now and then. But if for you, you don't want nothing to do with that and you just want to talk and give tips, you can do that too. If you just want to throw quotes with a little like video background, you can do that too. Just find out what makes sense for you and start showing up as that. Because I'll tell you something, if you force yourself too much outside of the box and it starts draining you, people will notice. People will see you're disengaged. People will see that you're not invested in it. And at the end of the day, like what they want is you. They want that quality connection. And if that's not there because you're not vibing with it, it's not even worth it. Yeah. And so what about the pressure that I think a lot of especially newbies to the social media space feel to have to literally live on social for 10, 12 hours a day, just be fucking posting all day long and then facing the burnout? Like, how do we prevent that? Yeah. I mean, I think just knowing that it's not about the quantity of posts that you have. It really is about the quality. And so giving yourself permission to jump into whatever consistency makes sense for you. So if that means three posts a week, then that's three posts a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that's consistent that you can keep up with versus three posts a day, Monday through Friday. And by Friday, you're exhausted and burnt out. Because if you focus on a quantity and a consistency that makes sense for you, what you're going to show up and deliver on is going to be so much juicier and connects on such a deeper level than what a bunch of little mini posts out there can do. And I think that's a little bit of an unpopular opinion right now because people are like, just hurry up and get as much out there as you can. And if you can keep up with that life, then you know more power to you. But if you can't and you're feeling burnt out by it, it's not worth your time. And ultimately, I really like to think about social media, corporate life, right? But if you go into like a networking meeting in a networking group in a corporate event, it's huge, right? You're in this giant room, there's hundreds of people around, and you're just like, okay, I got to make my mark. I got to connect with a few people. The value doesn't come from having 60 conversations that were five minutes long with each of those people. The value comes with you having intentional conversations that were 10 to 15 minutes long, walking away with their contact information so you can carry that conversation in a coffee chat the next day and get to know them even more. That's social media to us. So consider it your landscape where it's not the vibe to go ahead and try to connect with hundreds and hundreds of people in very surface level conversations. Instead, make intentional connection and transition it out of the big room and into a smaller space. So start with the DMs, but ideally your email list, growing your email list, nurturing your email list is going to allow you to 
show up more intimately than what social media ever will. Yeah, it's so important to get folks out of that algorithm and into your own ecosystem that you control. Because at the end of the day, Zuckerberg can shut this shit down whenever he wants. And then it's like, oh, there goes my following. There goes my business. And we've seen it with huge accounts. I have this with really big clients of mine, 50,000, 500,000 accounts where all of a sudden their Instagram disappears and somebody flagged it and it spammed this and it's gone. You got to jump through hurdles to get it back. You do not own your social media followers, but your email list, you absolutely own that. You can connect with them. You can continue to work with them. So really making sure that you know, like social media is an opportunity that is free marketing. So take advantage of it for sure. I don't subscribe to not using it at all as an online entrepreneur entrepreneur, but don't do it in a way that drains you so much. Do it in a way that actually works for your business and works for your lifestyle. I love that advice. I think another area where folks tend to get overwhelmed is like this idea of having to show up on every platform. And I'm wondering if you have any advice for like how to make the decision of where best to spend your energy. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I subscribe to a three-prong approach. Number one, start with your anchor content. Anchor content is this podcast, a blog, a core email list, something that's a little bit more long form of the value that you're bringing. We're recording a 30, 40 minute podcast episode. You're writing a pretty long blog that probably has three or four points inside of it. Maybe you're writing a longer email. Find that core anchor piece and make that consistent, make that stick. A lot of people also do like media articles. So whatever works for you, Find your anchor content, write one of those a week or every other week if you can, like two a month or one a week. From there, pick one social media platform to start off with and to focus on until you can grow to the point where either you have help around you or you can kind of juggle two different social accounts for you to be able to work with. So figure out what that one additional social platform is and then have an email list. So that's your third one. And so you're going to work in this kind of three-prong approach for a good season while you build things up. And the reason why I want you to start in your anchor content is because nine times out of 10, you can make four to five social media posts from one blog, from one podcast episode where you're taking out a certain nugget and you're teaching it a different way. You use it as a carousel. You are teaching it via head talking reel. You do it as a quote, and then you use that to be able to create your content. And from there, you get people on an email list so that you can continue to nurture that. Start with that. And then as you see success, then you can add on TikTok or Twitter or LinkedIn. But don't feel the pressure to have to do everything at once. It doesn't go well. You're too stretched thin and it's going to feel very overwhelming. Absolutely. Excellent advice. Now let's talk about when it starts to make sense to outsource your marketing and maybe where's the best area to start to focus on. Yes, absolutely. So if you're looking to outsource your marketing, you're doing a couple of core things. Number one, what we started at at the beginning of the conversation is you have a very solid core brand strategy. If you feel like you can bring someone else into the loop in your marketing and they're just going to take over without that guidance or direction, you've got another thing coming and it's going to be a rocky road ahead of you. So making sure that you really have that solidified personal brand, who you are, what you're about, what your voice is, so that it's easier for someone to come alongside you, whether it's an agency or whether it's a full-timer, it's a VA, whoever in your business, where you're looking to get some help with your marketing, that they can say, okay, what has worked well for you? Who are you? How can I learn your brand voice? So really have that solidified. And this could be super simple with you taking the time to create a one-page doc that says, this is how I want to show up. Here's some social posts that really describe me that I really liked. Here's how I typically want to come across. So you can have that or you can have kind of a core brand strategy doc. So having that solidified foundation. Number two, if you're looking to outsource and you've had some success in your business already, so you've proven up your concept, you have offers that are working, you have some consistency on that coming in, and you know that by hiring help, it's going to allow you to live in your zone of genius, allow you to show up and do what you do best, typically as like the talent, the forward-facing brand um, and face of your business. And so someone can come alongside you and really help to offset the things that stress you out, really, like offset the things that are so much harder for you to do or that take up so much of your time and then allow you to show up that much stronger in other areas. So you've had some success. And then the third thing is in terms of 
who to outsource or what the right next position is or what that looks like, I really want you to think about the two main things. Number one is what's taking the most of my time and what can I hand off to someone else to buy back more of my time? And number two, what is not in my zone of genius? Even if it doesn't take a lot of my time, it isn't necessarily the thing that I'm the greatest at that I can bring a higher level expert to come in and kind of have that additional foresight. So you want someone who's going to help you buy back your time and someone who's going to see things through a different lens that maybe is kind of like filling your blind spot to help you elevate your business while you get to show up in your zone of genius more. Yeah, I absolutely love just the permission that working with you has granted me in like not having to do all of the things. And so I think the hardest thing is to start to learn how to let things go in your business, especially if you've been a solopreneur for a while. But I think we have to get really comfortable with not always trying to be the smartest person in the room when it comes to everything. And some shit is just like, you're not interested in learning. Like for me, I was just never interested in learning how to set up an email sequence. I know the shit needs to happen. (laughs) <laughs> but do I want to write seven fucking emails? And, and you know, like, I just don't. Yeah. I don't have to. And right. I think that's the thing. We have to give ourselves permission to just not have to do all the things. It's kind of this, like, mindset shift of I get to. Mm. I get to hire someone around me who's way more passionate about this thing that I really don't care about. <laughs> I get to step into my zone of genius more and hand off the reins over here. And so really having that shift of I don't have to, but I get to just really allows you to feel like you can open the doors of trust that much more with the person that you're bringing on board as well. Mm-hmm. Okay, so one thing that drives me nuts that people say when I have like, you know, one-on-one consultations with folks who are starting their businesses or who have had moderate levels of success and are ready to like take things to the next level is like this idea that I just got to go and pay for some Facebook ads and I'm good. And I'm always looking at them like, why do you think people have this idea that they could just like outsource marketing to like a ad and like, that's going to be the thing that gets them rich? I mean, if we're honest, it's because it's easy. It's conceptual conceptually the easy route. It's kind of like the lazy way to go about it because you're like, if I could just buy all of my sales, all of my followers through some ads and get them to be the thing that sells my business, like I don't have to show up online. I don't have to worry about social media. I don't even have to worry about my offer. Like this passive income la la land is where we want to live in. And we skip the 27 steps that were necessary for people to get to there to begin with. And we jump into like step 29 and think, great ads, boom here. And the thing is like in general, ads can work incredibly well with your business. But if you have a faulty foundation, they will fail you so hard and you will regret all of the money that you put into it by skipping it the first time. There's no shortcuts to building a business. So if you're looking for like a get rich quick, want to make it happen ASAP without the hard work and hustle, like you're not going to find that in entrepreneurship. That is not the industry for you. And I'm a big believer in building businesses around our lifestyle, finding that rest, really allowing yourself to have a balance of hustle and heart. But at the end of the day, there is a lot of work that goes into creating this from the ground up. And that gets to be the lifestyle, the freedom that you achieve because it's the fruits of your labor. But there's some labor there, not just like throw some money at some ads and call it a day. (laughs) Right. I always ask them like, okay, what would you actually have the ads say? Because you have to have some proof of concept when it comes to your marketing in order for you to actually have ads that work. And so I think a lot of folks don't make that connection. Like, Yeah. And I think the thing is, like, I really feel like sometimes as we get in the weeds of our business, as we're creating it, we kind of forget about who we are as consumers. So a lot of times we're like, oh, I need to get ads up. But let's think about this. If you as a consumer saw an ad on your Instagram or on social, on Facebook, what's the first thing you're probably doing with this stranger online that's showing up in an ad? Number one, is the messaging resonating? Is it something that you need? But number two, even if those to hit the mark, you're probably Googling them, looking for reviews, going to their social media accounts, trying to figure it out. If it's like a product, then you're going and you're looking at reviews on Amazon. Like you're doing more digging. And the more that we step into this digital world, the more comfortable people are with validating what they're seeing through ads. 
online with their own kind of really quick searches. So if you neglect your organic marketing and you just focus on ads, when people are driven to you and to your account and they go to see who you are on social, if that doesn't show up the same way your ads are, or if it doesn't connect with them enough, they're because they're going to feel like they don't trust you. And if you're trying to do ads, you're working with a cold audience that doesn't know who you are and you have to have some things in place to get them to trust you or they're not going to purchase. Yeah. It really is about, like you said, creating that solid foundation. So for folks who are in the beginning stages of their entrepreneurial journey, and they're like, okay, I want to start off this whole marketing, branding situation right, what's one thing they can do today to get themselves ready for the next level? I want you to think about your offer. And not a lot of people start there. They'll jump into who you are, what you're passionate about. That's so important for sure. Just really kind of like figuring out your secret sauce a bit. But some people get so stuck on that, that they actually forget to start working with clients in some way, shape or form. And ultimately, I want you to focus on revenue driving activities. So think about what you would like to offer, how you would like to help people, and then start to work with someone in a smaller one-on-one, smaller group program kind of intimate setting. If I could just double that up with like, because what I don't want to happen is people work on the offer behind the scenes and they don't build an audience. And that kind of goes hand in hand. So while you're thinking about what you actually want to offer and how you can put that together, still show up online, still show up for your people, still just add value. And you know what? If you do not have an offer and you're like, I have no idea, but I know I want to teach this thing, then just start teaching the thing. Put it out there. Give Give yourself permission to start messy and to get something out there first. And then as your audience grows, as you start to get feedback, then the offer ideas will come that will all come to the table. But ultimately, like it comes down to connecting with your people in some way, shape or form and not isolating yourself. That's like the biggest mistake I'll say I did in the start of my business, working so much behind the scenes and not actually forward facing. It meant I was really creating my offer in a bubble or I was like building my brand on my own. And when it came to kind of putting it out there, it was that much more of an upward battle because then people are like, oh, I didn't realize you were doing this thing versus welcoming them into the process as it is. Absolutely. And I feel like people love kind of following the journey that you're going on. So like, don't be afraid to show that stuff. Your evolution is actually really inspiring for a lot of people. Yeah. And as you're putting your offer together, I mean, pull people online, get on stories and say, I'm, I'm thinking of doing this. What are your thoughts? Would you like this or that? Are you interested in this format? And even if you don't have like a business Instagram, you probably have a personal one. You probably have a friends and family one. Like it's okay to just start with whatever network is around you and then to start to grow from there. We all got to start somewhere. And where you start is not going to be where you finish. So relieving the pressure of having to get it right to begin with is going to free you up to just try new things. I love it. And I love this conversation, Nicole. So I know folks are going to want to find out how they can work with you. What are the different offers that you have to help folks take their marketing to the next level? So tell us all about that. Yeah, so we have two ways to work with us. We have our Brand Vibe University, which is essentially working with entrepreneurs who are looking to learn how to grow and scale their business through online programs, through courses, through one-on-one mentorship. We actually are about to launch our Elevate Your Offer Bootcamp, which really helps you focus on creating that core offer, but then marketing it to an audience that makes sense. And then from there, we have some group programs to really help you step into who you are as a CEO, as a leader, as an entrepreneur. But on the other side is I actually also have a done for you agency. So with that, the brand vibe, we work with clients who already have had success in their business and are really looking to get to a point where they're ready to outsource. And we really work alongside them to help them launch their programs, launch their services, market their business, and really get to that next level. I like to say that that's where we help people buy back their time, live in their zone of genius while we do what we love, because this is the shit that we love. Like we <laughs> love the marketing stuff that so many other people don't need to. They get to hire us so that they can kind of do what they do best. So those are the ways to connect with us. Amazing. And where can we find you on the interwebs and social? Yes, you can find us at the Brand Vibe everywhere or Brand Vibe University online on Instagram, Facebook, and then on TikTok. I have my personal account, the Nicole Nieves. You can check me out there. But yeah, that's where you can connect with us. Amazing. Thank you so much for this really, really useful information. If anything, I want you all to take away this idea that you have full permission to show up as you want 
you make the rules here. You are creating your own business and give yourself permission to just create the business of your dreams. And know that you are starting at the same place that other people are starting at. Don't compare your beginning to someone else's middle. Just focus on what you do best right now and let it evolve where it needs to go. I love it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Janice.